This Week in Science would like to thank AudibleKids.com for their support of this hour of science programming. Morning, Kirsten. Whoa. That was an interesting one, Justin. Good morning. I've got a cold, so I'm thinking you I do? could. Yeah, which is a perfect opportunity for me to do an entire show as Krusty the Clown. Oh, I think we can do without Krusty the Clown this morning. No, <laughs> Krusty's one of. I don't know. I, I have a soft spot in my heart for Krusty, but you know he's a little bit annoying. Uh, There's obnoxiousness yeah. going on. I've heard that. Now. I've heard it before. Welcome to This Week in Science. It's a bit after 8.30 in the morning on Tuesday, December 4th. It's Kirsten and Justin here, and we are going to be with you for the next hour talking all about science news. What else is new? Probably and- some stuff that's not science. Cause- <laughs> Maybe some stuff that's not science, but I think we're going to do all right. Unfortunately, this morning, we're not going to have Michael Stebbins joining us. Which I'm, I'm kind of suspicious about. I understand your man says he has a cold, but gosh, there's so much good science policy stuff this last week. And I didn't bring it because I thought he would. But maybe you can remember it if you didn't put it down on paper. Maybe it's still in your brain. If I didn't put it down on paper, it leaves (laughs) the show completely. Anyway, yeah, he's got a cold this morning. He said his voice just doesn't, it's not going to work for the radio. So he he said, I'm out. He sent me an email this morning. Not going to happen. And, uh, yeah, I have no, I have no, like, you know, some people have photographic memories where they can see something, read something once, whatever, and then it's there. They can always go back and access it. My, my brain is constantly erasing while I'm in, like, lifetime of me <laughs> observing things. You're, you're, it is you're. erasing them from my memory. I don't know what it is. Things get replaced very easily. I don't know if there's anything <laughs> going in after it. I think it's just I have a very, I was, you know. I'm, I've got old hardware, very limited memory, very limited hard drive. I can't, I can't even, don't even try to store pictures or a song in my head because it just, well, it'll take forever to save. And well, then anyway, not. we've got a lot of science news for you today and we'll hopefully have enough time to get through it all as normally we do. I've got a big story on beetle feces, otherwise norm, known as frass. Mm. Well, it's That's not a fascinating. big story. It's a little story, but I just love the idea. Sounds of... fascinating, fascinating, Kirsten. Fascinating. Ah. Yes. And uh, since we don't have a guest this morning, I invite everyone out there who's listening to us live to call in this morning. We'd love yeah, to hear from you. Idea. And if you Bail have... <laughs> we don't need to be bailed out. No, We've no. got plenty of stories. No, this ship isn't sinking. <laughs> no. No, no, we we just grazed the iceberg. Justin, we couldn't. Justin, if we were taking on water, we'd be lilting right. Whoa! Our phone oh. number for those of you who would like to call. You, you keep it up. I'm going to turn your microphone down. <laughs> I'm wearing shin guards. <laughs> That's right. Just bring it. <laughs> bring it. Our phone number five three zero seven five two two seven seven seven. We'd love to hear from you. Find out where you are listening to us. And we'd love to hear science stories that you are interested in this morning. Let us know what you're you're reading, what you think is interesting. 530-752-2777. And our website, if you'd like to continue conversations later on during the week, is www.thisweekinscience.com. I've been a little bit... uh, I haven't been updating as much the last couple of weeks, but uh, I've been uttering... Uttering. You, uttering, yeah. You can go to the website, and on a daily basis, I'm going to try and do this on a daily basis, I'll do short science blurbs, stories that we did not get to during the show, things that I think are interesting. It's an audio file. You can listen to it on the website. And one of the interesting things is if you follow that link back to um, the Utters website where it's originally posted, 
you can give me an audio response so I can hear what you think about my utter. So let's, mm. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very, yeah. You can't actually see Kirsten's utter on this website. So no. for those of you there's, hoping. There's none of that. And I guess that's about it for the announcements. Let's move on, huh? Yeah, let's do some science. Based on a report by Malcolm Ritter, of the AP Science Writer where I found this, a Japanese researcher has pitted young chimps against human adults in a test of short-term memory. Dun, dun, dun. And the grand and, champ. Oh, it's got to be humans, right? It's got, we're so smart. we got the big brains. We've got the lots of infolding. It's all really good stuff in the brain, right? Go. Well, actually, if it was humans that won, it wouldn't really be that newsworthy for the show. So, of course, exactly. it was the chimp that won. Researcher uh, Tetsuro Matsuzawa of Kyoto University, a pioneer in studying the mental abilities of chimps, said even he was surprised. Results are in the current issue of the Journal of Current Biology. <coughs> Old. One memory Ooh. test included three five-year-old chimps who'd been taught an order of numerals, the order of numerals between one and nine. And uh, so the, the, the three chimps and five, or no, excuse me, a dozen human volunteers, they saw the nine numbers displayed <laughs> on a computer screen. A lot of human volunteers that went in going, this will be easy. I yeah. can beat a chimp. Oh, yeah. It's just a chimp. Come I on. I wonder if they even, well, I'm sure the chimp wasn't in the room with them <laughs> no. staring them down. So they might not even realize. There was no intimidation factor. About to be beat down by a chimp. <laughs> When they touched the first number, though, of this, this one to nine that was randomly displayed on the screen, the other eight would turn to white squares. So then you'd have to remember where all the rest uh, of the numbers were. Like a game of concentration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, both of them were doing okay. They were both about 80%. The chimps weren't any better than the humans until they started to reduce the amount of time. Really? Okay. Yeah. They, they took out one of the chimps named Ayumu. Uh, who actually did uh, who did track a little bit better than the rest of the chimps and better than some of the, the students. And he pitted him against the nine, stu uh, nine, nine students for a second test. So this time, the numbers flashed on the screen only briefly and before they were replaced by the, the blank squares. Challenge again was to touch these, remember the proper sequence. When the numbers were played for about seven-tenths of a second, College students and the chimp were actually both about 80%. Mm -hmm. They were still holding on to a pretty good percentage there. But when the numbers were displayed for just four tenths or two tenths of a second, the chimp took over. Huh. The chimp stayed at 80% while the humans dropped to 40 or below. So the brief of the time was too short for, for the students, the humans, to look around to track all the, the squares. Right, to get an idea of what was in the what they were looking at. Indicating that uh, Ayumu, the chimp, was taking in the whole set at once. At once, yeah. Wow. So just sort of it's remembering the full picture of them instead of, like, individually tracking. Even with six months of training, three of the nine students in the second test failed to catch up with him. Huh. Even after six months of practicing on this, just couldn't do it. Uh, he thinks a couple of the factors, maybe actually the chimp's age, uh, for one thing, because uh, uh, because they're five-year-old chimps, because they're kind of younger, they're still in that really that sort of like young humans, you know, really learning new things. And this mm -hmm. is probably one of the bigger things that they've been putting forward. Um, now they want to do the test again. Um, with younger humans younger people? versus people. I mean, hum humans versus young. humans versus people. Humans versus littler <laughs> humans, and likewise, chimp versus children. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. I wonder if it is a developmental uh, process, something that that's developmental, or if it's something that is evolutionarily based on the needs of the of the animals. Where you know, chimps evolving in the jungles. You know, where wherever they're wherever they're living, maybe it makes better sense for them to be able to take in an entire scene you know, with more predators and that actually kind of does stuff. believe that human ancestors gave up much of their of that skill uh, through the evolutionary process, making room for things like language ability. Hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah. But yeah, the older they actually did some on some tests on older chimps, and the older chimps did worse than the college students did worse than did do oh, worse than the humans. So older chimps. Older worse. chimps weren't as good. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. Interesting. Maybe they're just, they don't care as much. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, whatever. I don't care. Well, it turns out that our, our ancestors, some, uh, a group of ancestors, extinct homo relatives of the Homo sapiens, known as Paranthropus robustus, 
are actually very sm- more similar to gorillas <gasps> than they are it, to humans in their social structure and their, their growth patterns. So mm-hmm. researchers from UCL Department of Anthropology, Dr. Charles Lockwood, published in this week's Science magazine that he, uh, he and a group of researchers checked out some old fossilized specimens of this ancient Homo sapien relative and found that the males seemed to continue to grow throughout throughout their young their their life. So in humans we have a dis, a very distinct growth period where females and males grow until the end of their developmental stage and then they stop growing. And it turns out that in gorillas and in these Paranthropus robustus fossils, the males seem to have the traits of growing continually so that they reach a much larger size than the females ever do. Mm. And in the goru- and by linking the, the growth patterns of this, this, these fossils with modern gorillas, what they're, what they're thinking is that the old social structure was, must have been similar to that of gorillas, where the males would have kind of a, a high payoff, yet you know, in the, ter- in, this, in the sense that if they grow well, if they survive, they'll be able to attract lots of females and be able to have, they'll be like the silverback with their tribe of females taking care of all the females in the group. But It's good to be the silverback. But because they're growing and it takes so long for them to grow to their full size, then it's also very dangerous to them and they have a high predation risk as well. So it's risky, yet there's high payoff for their growth patterns. And uh, what the, something that's really interesting about where the fossils came from is this area, um, let me see what it, it's called, Swartkrans, and it's an area within the... Uh, South Africa's cradle of humankind world heritage site that's near Johannesburg in Africa, South Africa. Um, they think that this site was actually a, like a, a litter box of, for predators, where pre- predators like hyenas and jackals and leopards and these, these old predators would take their prey to eat them and dump the bones. And so it's this, this site where it's just littered. Pretty, pretty nice find. Right, and so it's just littered with all these these fossil bones, and it turns out that there are many more male fossils than there are females, which kind of links to the idea that males might have been, you know, traveling on their own. So when they when they reach maturity, uh, they get kicked out of the group that they're living in, and they have to set off on their own to find their own females. But in during that time, it's very dangerous because they're on their own. They're not quite at their full size. They're at a high risk for dying. And so they're thinking that that's why they're finding so many more males than females in this particular site is that there was much more predation for them. And this is the predator dumping ground where they're it's finding still, the bones. That's still just something seems weird to me about that. Yeah. Like to have a predator. Is, I mean, do we? Is, is that something that's – I've never heard of that, a, a predator dumping ground where like lots of animals – because I would think like, you know – even a cheetah is going to take its prey and it's going to drag it somewhere. It's going to drag it up in a, into a tree where most other predators can't get to it. It seems right. like you would want to keep it away from where all the other predators are. You wouldn't want to bring it to the feast like a big smorgasbord. <laughs> I'm sure it's not that that kind of exact. It's like I'm it's, a, it's a pretty large area. Uh, yeah, and I'm picturing what it is. It's actually like a giant nest. A giant nest of, a, <laughs> of a yet undiscovered giant bird giant that would bring back eagle. gorillas and other <laughs> <laughs> other prey and drop it off to its young. Yeah. But speaking of, I think I think it's pretty pretty interesting though that they're able to they're the they had enough fossils that they're actually starting to be able to look at the diversity yeah. within this particular this one specific species to be able to look at maybe growth patterns and be able to infer social patterns in a similar way. So it's just it's just fascinating. I like it. It's mm-hmm. interesting. Amazing duck billed dino find in North Dakota. Possibly the most intact dinosaur ever found. Wow. Woo. 10,000 pound hadrosaur, nicknamed Dakota, was actually discovered in 1999 by Tyler Lyson, then 16, now 24, and currently a graduate student in paleontology, of all things. Ah, fancy that. You find, that you, find, you find a dinosaur and then go, hey, maybe I can go into paleontology. You know, isn't that a great, hmm. that's, such, that's a good story all by itself. So, okay, what makes this specimen so unusual is that Dakota is fossilized with the skin and bone turned to stone and shows ligaments, tendons, and once fully examined, may also have internal organs. Hmm. 
That's impressive. Yeah, finding a dino so so nearly in the flesh has uh, actually altered some of the characteristics about which were only guessed or surmised at previously. The skin is a relief of both large and small scales. It has some evidence to suggest that it may have even had stripes. Stripes. That, and yeah, and had like different colored stripes on Ooh. it. Yeah. That's so neat. It's just so rare that you find act- the the soft tissues that get fossilized as well. Yeah, and, it's and well sh- enough that you're able to actually be able to figure out traits of the animal. And it's a huge animal and a huge swath of this skin is actually available. I mean, it's yeah. like, it lo- looks like if it was still in a leathery form, you could really redo a number of couches. Mm. Scientists are estimating that its backside bulk is actually 25% larger than previously thought on the, on the uh, hadrosaur. Apparently, the bulk was muscular, upper legs and tail, and had enough all the connective tissue there to indicate that it needed a retooling of the locomotion, which they've done, and it's giving the uh, giving the beast a running speed of about 28 miles per hour, which is g- g- did really fast. Yeah, you'd be hard pressed to outrun that animal. Yeah, that's a good mm-hmm. 10 miles an hour faster than uh, Tyrannosaurus Ty- rex, who was also found in this the same area of the Dakotas. Um, and was most likely the biggest predator of the hadrosaur. So yeah, they're pretty good. He can outrun them. But then you know, and if that if that is the biggest prey of the Tyrannosaurus Rex, they would have had to either they would have been much more scavengery than like racing down a prey like that. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> ten mile an hour per difference is like well, it's sort of like if uh, I'm chasing you, um, but I'm standing still. And you're moving away from me at 10 miles an hour. That's what a 10 mile an hour <laughs> difference would be. Wait, thanks well, for no, clarifying but I mean, that's that, kind Justin. Of, that's significant. <laughs> it is the significant. Hunter prey <laughs> ratio there. Uh, spacing between vertebrae is nearly half an inch. And it seems wow. like, yeah, this is more than uh, what's been assumed in a lot of models. In fact, a lot of times when, uh, when they're putting them to get bones together for displays, like in museums and things like that, they actually put those vertebrae very tightly Tight, together right so um certain dinosaur specimens on display c- could grow as much as as uh three feet in length <laughs> just based on that fascinating um and, and, and it's all and that's just hadrosaurs but that could really be all dinosaurs if you look at maybe you know this is because this is like this if is, it's if, if that's something a characteristic that is continuous mm, among correct. dinosaurs you'd have to find more i guess distantly related dinosaurs with a similar situation to be able to make that kind of an assumption, though, I yeah. think. More on this book in stores now. Well, right now we have none other to go. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> exactly. none versus some. I'm going with some. <laughs> More on this uh, in bookstores now as well as a documentary coming out. Uh, maybe it already did or sometime soon where they've, uh, they've got lots to look at. So they're, gonna, they're, trying, to, they're trying to isolate proteins from it. They're, they've, yeah. they're using some really high-tech uh, scanners that's usually used by, uh, I guess, NASA and Boeing to test aircraft and internal components and things like that. So they're actually looking at the insides. There's an alligator inside of it. What? Uh, yeah, a very large alligator-type uh, ancestor inside that they think uh, may have crawled into the creature uh, after oh. it died. Right. To uh, begin a feast and may have, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe there was a shifting or maybe it got stuck somewhere. But <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Maybe it crawled in during like a yearly hibernation yeah. or something. It was just a cold night. <laughs> it was just cold. <laughs> it was a scene from Star Wars. <laughs> There's a potential even, you Crawling know, inside if the they can find body. some tissue in there that hasn't completely fossilized. It. Hmm. You know, and then the next thing you know, we got the hadrosaurs around the park. How smart do you think your dog is? Uh, well, you know I'm a little bit afraid of dogs in general. <laughs> but of the dogs I know, I'd say some dogs are very intelligent. Right. Well, researchers at the University of Vienna in Austria have come up with a new way that's ba- a new way to test the intelligence traits of many animals, <laughs> species of dogs that has it that it's never been used to to be tested on dogs before but it's been tested on monkeys and other species and humans and birds it's what they did is they used touch screen technology to test dogs abilities to make up uh concepts wow. to be able to un, to be able to create concepts within their 
quote unquote mind. But wouldn't I see now right off the bat there? I would think that that would create a problem because I thought their vision, like, oh, I've well, never seen a dog watch television. But they or can even pay attention. To they it. they could. I mean, if you if you train them, I mean, basically these animals were trained to pay attention to a screen. And get, by giving them a reward in re, you know in return for their mm-hmm. acting in a particular way, uh, and yeah, they don't have full the full complement of color receptors, but they do have you know they have uh, blue green vision, so they basically have night vision. Um, wow. They don't have the color vision that we have. They don't have the full. They don't have the red. Everything they're basically like color blind. Wow. They're color blind in the sense of how they see. Um, but these researchers published in Animal Cognition, they took four dogs and they showed them pictures of landscapes and dog photographs. Okay? And then they trained the dogs to respond to dog pictures. So if they touched the screen, they touched the screen when they saw a dog picture and then they would receive a food pellet hmm. as a reward. So it would be this positive reinforcement. You see a dog, yay, you get food. Do it again and again and again. So that's just testing the con- the concept. Can they could they learn to do this task? Could they touch the screen and rec- and pick one picture over the other? Yes. Right. The first test though, they were shown completely different dog pictures. So they hadn't seen these pictures before, and they were shown different landscape pictures that they had not seen before and wanted to see if they could take a new set of stimuli and transfer the concept of dog so would they respond to dog pictures that they had never seen before in the same way as they responded during the training phase and the answer is yes the dogs reliably returned to the pictures of dogs in the in the final phase they showed the dogs new dog the new dog pictures that were pasted onto familiar landscape pictures so they basically overlaid the dog pictures over the landscapes. And so now they're getting conflicting messages. So they're supposed to respond to a dog, but they're not supposed to respond to the landscape. So what what do they end up doing? Interesting. Yeah. Because that means not just – they weren't just looking for the reward. They were also had a – a negative uh, right because they because the, the negative the negative reinforcement was they didn't get anything for responding to landscape pictures so they learned not to respond and to them landscapes bad <laughs> yeah exactly don't do that it's not going to get you anywhere and so what they ended up finding is that when the dogs were given a choice between a new dog on a familiar landscape and a new landscape that they'd never seen before minus dog they responded to the pictures of landscapes that contain dogs. Hmm. So they were able to, what the researchers believe is that these animals, these dogs that they tested, were able to form a concept of dog and respond to that and be able to know reliably what to respond to. It doesn't tell, tell us whether or not they actually recognized them. So whether or not they were yeah. able, I mean, it doesn't, you, we don't so know the whether, they would, whether they would recognize the dog in the picture as an actual dog. Here, here's the next step then, see? Then you give them a series after series of two dogs mm-hmm. at a time and let them rate the dogs. Attractiveness? Yeah, and if there's certain <laughs> dogs that are tending to, you know, come out on top, there you have it. You ha- Then you found some doggy preferences. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are many dogs who, it, it, I mean, anecdotally, it's been shown that, you know, dogs can respond to you know, fetch the ball versus fetch the stick. Like if you gave them, if you trained them on those things, on particular objects, and got them, you can get them to re- retrieve one versus the other. You can, they respond to particular commands. They do have, um, it, it's, it would seem that by being associated with humans for so long that maybe they've had to develop the abilities to be able to recognize certain things, to be able to react, respond to certain things. So, you know, maybe there are concepts and uh, abilities that they have that we don't even understand or, or know yet. The interesting thing about this, meth- this method that they've used is that it's been used successfully in many other species of animals, but it just hadn't been used in dogs before. So it's really neat that now this opens up a whole new way to test dogs' abilities, their cognitive abilities, without having human interference. Are they, because are, because are they historically, touching with their noses? Probably. I don't know. Mm. 
I have to keep wiping donk, the screen. Donk. Yeah. The <laughs> but it takes you can you can put them in a cage or you know a chamber with the screen in front of them. A chamber. Not, cha- not chamber. Cage is fine for a dog. Not chamber. chamber. Chamber sounds frightening. All right. Chamber sounds like something really <laughs> bad is about to happen. A testing room. Okay. There you go. A testing room. Testing lounge. Testing lounge. Yes. Okay. There we go. And you, it'll it'll uh, make if you can set up the right tests, it'll give researchers the ability to oh. test them on all sorts of different things without human interference. And their responses are simply w- how what they do, how they interact with that computer screen. There's no interpretation. There's no, oh, I think the dog liked it, you know, and there's none of that inf- that human inference that in so many animal psychology studies biases the studies. Yeah. I right. mean, it, there are videos. There's one video I saw of, what is it, uh, Coco? Was it Coco? The, the gor- Coco's the gorilla. Gorilla there with was, the sign language. Yeah, there was one with Coco the gorilla, and there's another with, who, I don't remember, there's a chimp with sign, sign language yeah. also. But basically the... The vid- there's like this video that's supposed to show how well, how much this this primate understands. And it just, you watch the video and it's it's ridiculous. It's the, the researcher is leading the animal. The researcher yeah. is like, there's all this interaction really that's taking place. Thing, and like, it's like the animal's not doing anything. The really interesting thing would have been know. to put that chimp and that gorilla um, in rooms next to each other and with a clear window, whatever, so they could communicate and just see what they talk about when we're not around. I know. That would be, that would be. There, there actually was something, uh, I heard something, there was something where, I don't, never mind, I don't, I don't remember it exactly, so but I'm not going to say is anything something. about it. Well, i tell yeah. you what, there's, my uh, baby's mama, who's from Denmark, um, mm-hmm. had, uh, has a dog, it's a very intelligent dog, mm-hmm. and I just remember her saying one day in class, she was explaining to another student that um, she, all the commands for the dog are, are in Danish. And the other student being like, oh, your dog can speak a foreign language? <laughs> and it was kind of like, now, well, I mean, obviously the dog's not speaking a foreign language. But the idea that the dog could even understand a foreign language is like, well, that's a really smart dog. When to a dog, any human language is a foreign. It yeah. was just, oh, wow. <laughs> I love it. Uh, where are we at now? We got more filler? Hey, where's that sideshow guy? <laughs> Give me a story. No, I got Give stories. Me, I got tons of story. I got. I'm gonna save this one for the second half. All right. Um, here's a good one for. <coughs> oh God. Um, Justin, you're in awesome shape this morning. I just want to say, honey, which I didn't um, partake in, is a better option for childhood coughs than over-the-counter cough, cough syrup. Medicine. Yeah. Wow. And you know what? I actually know this, or not know this, but this was like always a, a home remedy at my mm-hmm. house growing up. Is we would, you know, if you had a cough or a sore throat, you'd you'd take a spoonful of honey, you know, <laughs> and uh, it, it, before bed, and then you'd be you'd you'd sleep through the night and be great. But new study by a Penn State College of Medicine research team found that honey uh, offers parents an effective and safe alternative to the uh, over-the-counter, under-the-counter children's cough medicines. The study found that small dose of Buckwheat honey, given before bedtime, provides better relief of nighttime cough and sleep difficulty in children, uh, better than no treatment, and better than treatment with dextromethorphan, the big DM that you see <laughs> yeah. uh, on all the cough Dextromethorphan. Methorphans. Making, okay, over-the-counter cold medicines came in, coming in just as well as no treatment. Honey, wow. did Honey also does a better job in reducing the severity, frequency, and bothersome nature of coughs uh, from upper respiratory infection than, uh, again, same, than the over-the-counter medicines or, or no treatment at all. That's better than... So basically what... Do they the, have any idea why? Is it just co- the coating? Is it something in the honey that's some compound in the honey that has the effect? There's, You know, they. I know that they've used honey on wounds because it's... Yeah. It's, okay, it's somewhere in here. It's it has some, It has antibacterial properties. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> honey has been used for centuries in some cultures, blah, blah, blah. Honey's well-established antioxidants, antimicrobial effects, mm-hmm. which could explain its contributions. Uh, honey also soothes on contact 
and it probably sticks better a little bit. I <laughs> it's think a little it's sticky. a little bit more yeah. of a coating. Like if, a lot of times, I think it's raw tissue in the throat that keeps getting irritated and agitated because mm-hmm. it's all nervy and exposed from having been coughed on. And yeah, and it's being and, and the irritation. There's a bit of uh, swelling that's going exactly. on. Exactly. So yeah. then you get this nice honey coating. <laughs> and it doesn't so much. It's like a better mucus almost. Honey, uh, cross, the better mucus. <laughs> this was like a quadruple <laughs> blind study. One of those studies where the parents didn't know if they were getting um, honey flavored nothing, honey, or honey flavored uh, the DM deal uh, orphan making extra meth, which is kind of annoying because this is like they were talking about how. Um, there could be some serious side effects, potential side effects for kids under six years old using dextromethorphan. And therefore, mm-hmm. it's kind of weird that they would actually use that in this study um, in a comparison to honey, because that means they were giving um, some kids dextromethorphan. Dextra- but anyway, <laughs> um, I and just, the, the, so the doctors was only didn't children, know they who didn't was look, getting what. They didn't look at adults. Yeah, this is like, no, they were up to the age of 18, was the cutoff on this one. But this is one of those things like, you know, it's double, double blind, meaning the scientists didn't know who they had, who was getting what. The the parents didn't know who was Mm -hmm. getting what. That's the difference between doing it for science and doing it because you're a drug company, knowing who's getting what and paying attention to all these things. (laughs) All right. We'll be right back with a second half of This Week in Science right after these. Right. We'll be back in just a moment. Never wrote a song about robots. I think that that's a terrible crime So in celebration of our future captors I think it's about time Robots are great Robots are good Robots are taking over in your neighborhood Three cheers for our cyborg buddies You want t-shirts? We got them. You want music? Got that too. The This Week in Science World Robot Domination t-shirts and the 2007 Science Music Compilation CD are now available. Go to www.twis.org for more information. That's right. Welcome back. This is This Week in Science. Kirsten and Justin will be here for the next 24 minutes. We've got science stories going on. A caller during the break called in to say... Anonymous caller during the break called in to point out that uh, children under the age of one year should not be given honey in uh, any circumstance. Yeah, that is true. Yes. It is true. There are negative effects. I couldn't really effects, remember I why that is, but that's definitely the truth. Yes. However, forests should be given <coughs> beetle dung because ah, yes. beetle dung is good for forests. Yes. It is. A researcher at the University of Alberta Faculty of Ag- Fac- Facility of Agriculture, Forestry, and Home Economics in the Department of Re- Renewable Resources worked with beetle dung to figure out what was in it and what benefits it had on soil beetle droppings known as frass are actually very important crucial even to helping forests recover from forest fires Mm. so it turns out that they actually increase microbial activity in the soil which increases the uh, nutrients that are being laid into the soil uh, that are good for the plants that are going to be growing up after a forest fire comes through. Nice. Uh, one of the problems, however, is that uh, timber salvage is now removing dead logs in which beetles often lay their, lay their eggs and they're in which their larvae grow. So uh, what he's suggesting, the researcher here, is that maybe we need to let dead trees lie for or have logging delayed for a period of time and possibly even 
leaves some timber behind, a certain percentage of the total in the forest area that's being salvaged, just leave some behind and not take it all so that there's a place for beetle, beetles to live and grow and end up, you know, so they will end up maintaining the so forest great. in a positive manner. The, these, these fallen timbers are such sort of like now the poster child for both sides of the forest and deforestation, like sides of the argument, like the logging industry and the environmentalists are now going to both be able to point to dead logs. Mm-hmm. Like part of the logging, uh, um, Pro-logging folks have been saying, well, if you leave all that dead uh, lumber lying around, it's well, just it'll catch timber, fire it'll and grow, yeah. that's what starts fire spires. That's what helps them go. And the other side's like, no, we can say that there's beetles in there that are actually going to help after the fire. The thing that there was annoying There are a lot of me, things. There are a lot of things about, um, I mean, about leaving some stuff there. And forest fires are actually good for the environment. They can be. In a way. The thing that was good. annoying to me, though, is during the San Diego fires, I kept hearing all of this talk about, you know, and all the canyon fires mm. and stuff. That's because they never pull. They, they leave the dead lumber in there. That's why they've been the Sierra Clubs. Blah, 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 blah. Like all this kind of talk about, you know, all this old lumber lying around. And, and, and the thing is, that most of these are in places where there's not very many trees for those fires. Those are mostly grass fires mm. that got started, you know, in canyons and such. Scrub brush and that kind of thing. It had nothing to do with timber lying around on the ground. So, But, yeah, that's, you know, it makes sense that the, you know, the fact that there have been forests for so long and there have been forest fires and everything else and there wasn't, you know, logging going on. Maybe there is a system. Maybe part of the system allows forests to continue beyond a forest fire, which we've seen happen many, many times over the history. Mm-hmm. It just, it's, uh, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I just, I, I love the, the, sometimes the minutia of academic research is actually incredibly fascinating. I mean, the fact that somebody really got into beetle dung for their graduate work or whatever it happened to be to be able to come up with you know well it's actually good for forests you know okay fantastic (laughs) it's interesting i like it when a science comes together that's right as we uh as we head into the sweater wearing months of winter I'd like everyone to take a moment to consider the injustice of ignorance in the world being perpetrated upon mankind's most mistreated and misunderstood appendage. Speak, of course, about our, our longtime friend, the foreskin. Oh, what? There is a Southern African BBC radio correspondent, Kennedy Gondwe, who is having himself circumcised live on the air to get protection from AIDS in a bizarre sort of snippet before you hit it pro circumcision publicity campaign going on down there. Right. Actually, this is this has now since happened after I started uh, looking at this story. Um, I was going to offer that once it was removed that he send it to me and I would reattach it to myself. Oh, oh just, to, just to make my own public. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Kirsten's kind of no. looking pale now. This is OK. No. But this is for the result of the findings published in the Lancet Medical Journal in February. Disagreed with by me on the show, which concluded that three trials, Kenya, South Africa, Uganda, a claim to show that circumcision can significantly reduce men's chance of contracting virus caused by AIDS by as much as 100% difference. In my view, the findings were statistically challenged, and during the fact that education alone reduced the chances of the contracting the disease to a point where the differences between circumcised or not within a few percentage point, nowhere near the 100% difference that the study reported before being shut down prematurely so that the UN health agencies, which ignored me, as they always should, <laughs> they ignored me and endorsed the findings, but stressed that the procedure offers only partial protection. It doesn't offer protection. This is a misnomer. Mm-hmm. Here's, here's the, this is the part of the, I can understand, okay, this guy's on board with the public circumcision campaign. He's getting himself circumcised on the air. Hey, it's great for his career, too. Why not? Maybe he was planning on doing it anyway. Who knows? Who cares? This is what's really harmful. David Alnwick, a senior AIDS advisor to UNICEF, um, said that UNICEF supports educating people that, and I'm quoting, circumcised men are relatively well protected against HIV. Well, I'm going to really repeat that because I, that was a quote and it may have sounded like I was leaving something out. Circumcised men are relatively well protected against HIV. That's the education that UNICEF is supporting in Africa. 
It doesn't offer protection. It just lowers the probability that the the virus will be held again will be against your skin long enough to be able to possibly. Yeah, it, I don't even agree with that. But yeah. protection? Are you insane? Yeah, it's not going to help. It, that that kind of that kind of language is not going to help teach people that they just need to use protection. No, it's actually <laughs> contrary to education at that point. But he yeah. said there was a danger. There is a danger, not in adding too much credence to the poorly constructed overhyped study, but in that the danger lies in creating a demand for circumcision that the world's poorest continent is not now prepared to meet. That's the danger. That's the danger is that they're just not prepared to meet the demand for circumcision. Uh, New study started by me and ended just now (laughs) finds that removal of Mr. Alnwick from the position of senior AIDS advisor to UNICEF will greatly protect people from contracting HIV. (laughs) Snip, snip (laughs) to you, sir. Oh, my goodness. That's astounding. It is astounding. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. that's like jump up and down on your chair and scream at the computer that you're reading. (laughs) Did you? I'm sure you did. (laughs) No, I I had to, I went and had to go, I found actually multiple sources of where that statement was repeated. I I find that just mind-blowing that in this day and age, somebody could make a statement like that, that they, they are for educating that circumcision is leaves men well protected that is just nuts yeah yeah i'll agree with you there okay i'm done i'm on i'm (laughs) I'm on board i'm about to stand up on this chair (laughs) i know you're getting ready to go oh i've got so much fun stuff here a research project from develop or a system developed at the university of bath has developed a system called toe to heel air injection that is going to be used by Duvernay Petroleum to extract heavy oil from beneath the ground. As oil becomes more and more scarce, methods to extract oil from more difficult places where it's Siberia. stored. <laughs> well, in places, uh, there, there's lots of oil in gravel beds, so areas uh, beneath the ground where... It's not just easy to pump it up where it's got lots of stuff in it, where it's heavy, it's viscous, it's of a different of a of a different character altogether. It's harder and more less energy efficient, more expensive to get this oil out of the ground. However, this group at the University of Bath has created this new method that is being picked up and used by companies now to actually get at the oil that has traditionally been very hard to get at and which now is much more economic to get at because light oil is up at around $100 a barrel. Mm. This method, toe-to-heel air injection, how it works is it injects air into the oil deposit down a vertical well. Then that air gets ignited and the heat melts basically the heavy oil so it becomes less viscous and it gets it causes that less viscous oil to drain they have a second chamber that they've drilled that causes the oil so the oil drains into that second chamber and then they can pump they can pump more air in or and also use normal pumping technologies to get the oil out of that second chamber so it's the way that it works can produce oil for less than $10 a barrel. Wow. Yeah, so they're looking at getting this into 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 action in They didn't use air, but these oil field oil fields all over the place. Carbon. If they use pumped greenhouse gases down there. <laughs> I know, maybe they just then put the more. carbon then <laughs> see then the greenhouse gas could actually stay in that substructure and then pump out the oil. It'd be a nice little system we got to go. That's right. Now. Take out the oil, put the carbon back in. Maybe maybe they should look into that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, the 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 rationale behind this process is that that basically we're not we don't have the technologies yet. Our renewable systems, our hydrogen systems, our, you know, the fuel cell technology is not in place yet to be able to deal with the increase in price of the oil that we're using now. That uh, With our, our oil stores decreasing, we need to find a new way to get at the oil stores that we know are there but have been hard to get at. And so it's, the rationale behind it that this researcher gives is that it's basically like a... 
we need to switch to clean, he says, Professor Malcolm Greaves, he says, we need to switch to cleaner ways of using energy f- such as fuel cells, but we are decades away from creating a full-blown hydrogen, hydrogen economy, and we need oil and gas until then to wow. run our economies. And it's pretty true. Like, we, we are reliant on oil and gas, and as much as, um, you know, I'd love to see a transition to electric, to hydrogen fuels, you know, whatever else – from the oil and gas that we're currently using, it's not going to happen overnight. And it would be fantastic to be able to uh, decrease our reliance on oil from the Middle East when we could be able to get oil from Canada, from See, from down. I think it was uh, there's off of Brazil or something. There's another huge oil field. That Siberia has, mil- has more millions oil of than the entire Middle East. More yeah. diamonds in South Africa. But here's what I'm saying. I'm coming mm-hmm. from a de- – I, I take the opposite point of view. I think this is a bad idea. I think hundred dollar barrel oil. Oh no, I'm, I'd say, I'm with you, know you totally. I'm but it's let's gonna Let's go two hundred dollars a barrel. Okay, <laughs> let the oil companies make as mm-hmm. much money as they need to to secure all their future generations of families and stuff, and be done with the business. Just but let done. them take take the next generation's worth of money now, and then get everybody so hurt, <laughs> make us all pay so dearly that the alternative is actually a blessing, so that we can actually put our finances into something like an electric car. Oh, sure. Put something into... The I'm, one I'm, I'm actually with, the one I'm, I'm banking with you on, there. The like, biofuel that I think is going to work? Algae. Algae that's fed off of, of um, the CO2 output mm-hmm. from from uh, coal p- burning plants or other, well, other power plants. Yeah, th- I think... That one has the most, from the energy into the energy out system, that those algae biofuels are coming up with are insanely... They're like hundreds of times better yeah. than the corn, ethanol, all that biofuel and junk. it's not it's 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 decreasing the dirtiness of the coal power yeah. plants it's creating a, another fuel source that we can use and it's decreasing our need for land to grow all the those food those food stocks basically and it'll keep keep people in mexico able to buy corn for their tortillas and it's <laughs> oh wow and it's <laughs> algae which i just think is cool i think just and it's the algae. fact that it's algae mm-hmm. alone is yeah, no, it's I, I think it's a very I think it's a very Mexico's that's a got very its own problem. There's like technology. mariachi like people hunting each other down there right now. All these mariachi <sighs> shootings. I don't know what's up with me. what's up with West Mexico. Call me sometime. Tell me what's going on. <laughs> Sounds like things are getting rough over there. Things are getting rough. Yeah, it's I, I I agree with you on the on the oil front. I mean, I personally think it would be a great idea for us to not be able to use this. You know that we couldn't we can't figure out any way to extract this this oil that's down there because I think, you know, that'd be great. We wouldn't, our our reliance on oil wouldn't continue as long. But in the sense of economics and the way that our societies work, it's, we need it. We really do. And it's going to keep happening. But there is a huge movement. The green movement has grown and it's growing and growing and growing. And it's not, it has momentum now and it's not going to stop. So there is going to be continued research into these green technologies. I guarantee you, 90 cent a gallon gas Kills half the green movement. Oh, yeah. No, seriously. I believe people you. Yeah, who, if their pocketbook is not affected by the world around them, do not care. They just don't care. They've been foot dragging for years. Oh gosh, it's a dollar sixty, and people started thinking, oh well, let's start looking into the alternatives. Now it's double that, and people are still like, well, that stuff's years away. Let's see if we can just get it down to ninety dollars a barrel, then we'll be all right. Like, no, <laughs> people are adjusting too easily. We need two hundred dollar a barrel. Yeah. Go ahead; they can put the price up there. People will pay. They have no choice. They don't live anywhere near where they work. How about a nanobot powered by the power of sperm? Uh, huh? Huh? Some researchers from Cornell's Baker Institute of Animal Health have demonstrated the proof of concept that uh, the power supply that from which sperm gets its energy, the power of glycolysis, the power of glycolysis, actually, Mm. it can be tethered to a, a chip, a nickel nitrilotriacetic acid chip. Nickel NTA is what it's called. Now, what they've done is they have used used what they know about sperm power, which is that sperm rely on glycolysis and the enzymes within glycolysis to create, to convert sugar to ATP, which then powers that whip-like flagellum that 
drives the sperm home. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Yeah! yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they actually, what they did is they took the uh, the enzyme hexokinase and they replaced a sperm-specific targeting domain with a tag that binds it to a special gold surface, which allowed them to be able to put it onto this chip. And then they took the second enzyme in the glycolysis pathway, glucose 6-phosphate isomerase, what? and they attached that too to the chip. And they were both active in the when the, so when they were given glucose to break down, it they actually started the work that they normally do when they're with sperm but on a chip. So the proof of this concept is that it might provide Energy source? An energy source for very, very <laughs> tiny, 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 tiny things, wow. which has been the problem. How are we going to, we can make these little nanobots, how these little machines based, made, made out of little tiny biological molecules, different things. How are we going to power them? Where are they going to get their, where's their fuel source coming from? Sperm. So the good news, Mr. Jackson, is we can actually <laughs> get inside your artery and clear it out. Bad news is we're going to be injecting you full of nanosperm. That's what? right. How the, uh, the artery, the aneurysm versus the... Oh, man. Okay, here's something. Uh, climate change predicted a uh, drive of trees northward. Hopefully they're going to bring the beetles with them. Yeah, maybe they will bring the beetles. Most extensive and detailed study to date of 130 North American tree species concluded uh, that expected climate change this century could shift their range northward by hundreds of miles and shrink their overall range by more than half. This is a study by Daniel W. McKenney uh, of the Canadian Forest Service and his colleagues is reported in the December issue of Bioscience. If the trees were assumed to respond to climate change by dispersing their progeny to more favorable locations, basically assuming that they're... When it says here that they are, are respond to climate change by dispersing their progeny, I'm hoping that means that the other life forms that are usually in those trees also are heading north. And bringing the seeds, because I doubt the trees are going to do it themselves. <laughs> right. The, uh, the study of species would move by over 400 miles northward. 400 miles. So any, any localized tree, wherever you are in the United States, figure your tree moves 400 miles north. If your state tree is this, well, look yourself a few states north, yeah, maybe even over the border into Canada, and, and that's your new... Uh, hometown however that uh, hmm. the average range over that this is the most this is the most optimistic ability to, to adapt would still average uh, on average decrease the overall size of the forest by 12 percent if the species were assumed unable to disperse well uh, the average expected shift north was uh, just over a hundred mile uh, almost 200 miles not quite and but their overall size of the forest would reduce 58 percent some species, uh, so most species of tree would fall somewhere in between that. They also, the authors also note that under climate change, new species might colonize the southern part of the continent. So Ooh. we could be looking a little tropical. A little more a little tropical. tropical. in the, uh, you know, <laughs> in the heartland. Palm trees in the heartland, people. Yeah, well, they're already planting them places where they don't belong. I have a vendetta against palm trees really? in places where they don't belong. I, I really dislike palm trees. Oh, wow. I They're love the really looks of them, but I have lived on streets that had a lot of them on there. And at the first windy day, and then there's just palm stuff everywhere. And they it's always so look good. like they're going to fall. Leave the palm trees in L.A., people. Miami, L.A. I have actually out, out at the farmhouse, out at my little rural Central Valley farmhouse. There's a nice big row of uh, palm trees on the edge of the property. Which is so strange. Yeah, I but it's... I don't understand. <laughs> I do not understand the palm tree. It's a little bit of Hollywood out here in the middle of nowhere. Just, just stop with the palm trees, people. Cassini's spacecraft, after passing by Titan many times, they've passed by uh, several times, actually. They've tested it just to be sure that they saw what they thought they saw. 16 different encounters to make sure they saw what they saw. Researchers are publishing in geophysical research letters that... Titan contains large, heavy, negative ions in its upper atmosphere, which could be the organic building blocks <gasps> for life. Uh -huh. Dun-dun-dun. Yeah, Humans, so, uh, you have ventured too far. 
Huh? Right. The atmosphere does not contain oxygen, is mostly made up of nitrogen and methane. But these large plenty these, of nutrients in that for the right kind of life form. Yeah, there's lots of stuff there's lots of stuff that would that would could definitely It could be there now. Yeah. So these ions could grab onto rings of carbon and form molecules what that they call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are thought to be the earliest, earliest forms of life, their building blocks. So it's a, an interesting, interesting uh, result. They expected that they might find something like this on one of the moons of Saturn, but... we, You know, it's very likely if we did actually meet an intelligent uh, alien life form someday, that on that test that the chimps were beating us because it got down to a, you know, <laughs> a quarter chips. of a second, when they got onto that test, it might take them a full three seconds to recognize things. I mean, because time is different based on that. If you're a non-predatory planet, they could be like on sloth speed. Like, right. you we never know. Be, we could be way faster. We could be the fast, intelligent, crazy, smart aliens. Uh, Carolyn Porco from hey the Cassini Imaging team, she's the team leader, has sent out an email. She's asking people to... St to uh, take part in a contest that they're running to pick the best image from that's been taken by Cassini's cameras <clears throat> since its arrival at Saturn nearly four years ago. If you visit HTT HTTP colon slash slash Cyclops, spelled C-I-C-L-O-P-S dot org, you can vote for your favorite color and black and white images and your favorite movie clip as well. And... Uh, you will you you could possibly three lucky people will win a printed poster of the winning color image or an image of their choice. So if you take part in this, you could get a very cool poster to put on your wall. The voting ends at midnight December thirtieth, Mountain Standard Time. Results will be posted December thirty first. Voting begins now. So go to cyclops.org. Bet they pick one that has the <clears throat> rings. Possibly. I'm just guessing. Christopher Smith, Perth, you, Australia, Joseph Barney in Utah, Emilio Delis. I actually don't know where you're from. Victor, sorry to be so boring. Jason Etheridge, Matt Green, Edmond, Oklahoma, and Sanjin Zvonik in Tulane, New Orleans, Louisiana. That's a shout out for you. This episode of This Week in Science. Next week, we'll be interviewing Chris Impey on astrobiology, which, yeah, kind of tunes in nicely with Space that last story. And biology yeah. combined? Yes. Life in outer space. Uh, well, we will hey, be talking about it next week. If you learned anything from today's show, please keep in mind. Oh, it's all in your head. You just forgot. <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah, you pretended. <laughs>